and I learned about really just the power of the hashtags. Um, hashtag writing community, hashtag am writing. And so when I started to um, utilize those on my own post or click those for information, I was able to start connecting with other authors and other authors would follow back. And we really just started to, um, to boost and hype each other up. But uh, when I actually signed my publishing deal, each year that uh, a book is released, you're a debut, you kind of have like a class, so we're the class of 2023. And uh, so all the debut authors are in this sort of cohort. And it's been really beautiful because we have people that are memoirs, we have poets, we have those who write YA, fantasy, sci-fi, but we're all supporting each other and boosting each other's work. And I think that that's probably the thing that uh, I really saw in community building was how if you're part of an author community or writing community to make sure that you connect and writing is such a very introverted task it's something that we do usually on our own but through connecting with other authors beta readers writing groups uh, i really feel like i was able to support and create with other content creators <laughs> For me, when it comes to like the foundation or how to start building community, it's through service to others. And um, I know I work with my close friends have heard a lot, but um, I do go to a meditation center, and, <laughs> and I've learned so much from uh, these like this wonderful group of people on how to build community. And truly, it has been through service, whether I'm sick. Someone's like, hey, like, can I bring you a meal? Um, or just offering to help with random things. And so little by little, um, you begin to develop really strong relationships with people and good connections and wholesome connections. And so, um, yeah, I feel like that's where it started. And since moving to Dallas in 2019, during like right before COVID, right? I didn't have a lot of friends here in Dallas, and it wasn't really until this year that I had to start building my own community of people. Um, and that really kind of just started by like, hey, this person is this person. Like, I'm gonna go hang out, put myself out there. I'm gonna go meet some friends. Um, and really just went for it, and that's kind of how it started. So it feels very grassroots to me, and that's still where I am currently at in my community building process. But I have met so many incredible, beautiful people and that I love dearly. And um, we are building this wonderful community together where we all support each other. And I am so excited to see how much bigger it gets. So. <laughs> I'm from Dallas, but I moved to Austin uh, officially back in March of this year. So I was just like you, I have no friends on there. I was like, what do I do? Um, and what I know how to do is go out and have fun. And so that is what I did. <laughs> I went out almost to every single event I possibly could, whether it be in a club, a coffee shop, anything like that. But I did it all sober. And so people were like, wait. You're sober and you're acting like this crazy. And I'm like, yeah, you can do it without the alcohol, without whatever substance you might choose. And so that's basically how I started building my community down there um, and really getting the word out about sober society and kind of proving to everybody, you know, you can still do it. You know? Yeah. Okay. I would say that the foundation for my community building is just. Being intentional with who you surround yourself with to on a point, going to different events and meeting people, but it also depends on what kind of business you're running, who you want to be connecting with. So for example, what I'll be speaking about in my book, Slut to CEO, I was creating premium content online, and obviously the people that were important to connect with were different than the people that I connect with now as I am pursuing my modeling career. And I think that that just has made it a little bit of a learning curve to see like how I need to shift my content creation based on who I'm trying to reach. Yeah, no, for sure. So I guess 
my next question will be um, but more attention to um, Teresa's point. How were what were those struggles that you found yourself in trying to establish that difference, that different audience you were going to? And then I guess for the rest of you guys, what were y'all's struggles in community building? Yes. I would say that when I was kind of making that switch, I had built multiple platforms on the basis of my premium content creation. And so I still had like a large amount of following, but I was losing engagement. And I think that sometimes you just have to accept that there are going to be times that you're growing and there are times that you are resting and you really can't um, like blame yourself when your growth is not linear. So I think that that's kind of how it's been different because I've had to reach new audiences. I've had to connect with people in different ways because obviously the people that were subscribing to my premium content, they are looking for totally different content than the people that I'm trying to connect with now because obviously before a lot of my content was uh, more obviously physical and now I am trying to build up a community that really supports me for me and rather than you know feeling objectified more often than not. For me, the biggest struggle, um, and I think for any creative and any artist, is isolation. And I think it kills a lot of people's progress. And um, that's basically where I had been for so long, uh, was just in this creative isolation. I wasn't around people that were also creating or doing anything. And um, I was also stuck in corporate America for a long time, which is very, for me personally, was so sucking. Some people do great at it, you're doing great at it. <laughs> um, so that was my biggest struggle, just being isolated and not having the energy and the time to put the, the energy and require into pursuing my creative passions and my dreams and being able to build a community around the things that I love versus my time constantly being absorbed by a thing that I didn't. So following my passion and making myself more available and less isolated was how I had to work to slowly overcome where I was when I first started building my community. So. For me, there were really two issues that I faced when I started uh, trying to build and connect with the other creatives and off the community right on the First and foremost, I had a career, still am, a, jur a journalist, but I had been a sideline sports reporter for years. I've been on television, local news, um, started my career at WFA. And when I first made the decision that I was going to pivot from more of the journalism side into the writing side, um, I kind of thought, well, everybody that follows me is following me because they want college football or high school football scores or they want updates from like they don't they don't want to hear about money or literary world and I was prepared to basically wipe the slate clean and start an entirely new you know, Instagram entire, entirely new Twitter and uh, I was actually on Clubhouse remember when Clubhouse was banging for a little while uh, but I was on Clubhouse and in a in a in a chat room and discussing this, and one of the, the young ladies, and she she went to my profile page, she pulled up all my social media, and she said, "Absolutely don't do that." She said, "Don't start up." She said, "If you're a memoirist and you're writing about your real life struggles, the people who have followed your career and have watched you on television will want to know about those things. And if they don't, it's okay. If you lose people, if they if they have no interest, and I feel like I was very fortunate because that." was the case that I didn't really lose that following. I just started pushing out on this content about writing books. Like it was this big pivot 
and I started to do an announcement and all of that saying, hey, I'm going to, and I just decided not to. And I, I still worked in some sports and transitioned to talking about more creative uh, outlets, but um, it's been really interesting to see that the same, you know, sports fans are still following that part of my career. The other part of it, for me, was more of facing some personal shame. Because with my memoir, I talk about really hard, difficult topics of mental health, uh, overcoming addiction, sexual trauma from childhood sexual abuse, and the people who had watched me had no idea that that was my story. And so I was putting out these personal details, uh, especially the addiction side of things. There's such a stigma with that. And I really had to overcome my own personal fears about putting that information out there. But I also had to sit down and set boundaries for myself and say, what do I not want to share? What do I feel is oversharing? What am I not okay with putting out there? So like my hard limits are pictures of my kid and my husband and my family. This is my story. They don't need to be involved in that. So um, to sum that all up very quickly, I would just say the thing that I've learned with content is to do what makes you feel comfortable. Don't try to mimic the trends. Um, don't try to overshare. If you don't feel like something is right for you, if you feel like something infringes on your safety or your mental health, then, then don't do it. Uh, you know, it's not worth the likes, it's not worth the clicks. Uh, if you're putting content out there and connecting with people, the audience will find you. Um, especially whenever you kind of touch base on sharing your deeper struggles, so essentially the true you, when you have this following that only expects sports or only expects the premium content, and you really have to take this huge shift and share the more vulnerable side about each and every one of y'all. How was that for you guys internally? Um, Switching so majorly, but also in y'all's own personal mental health. Trying to build this community that you guys really, really want to do, and y'all will do what y'all need to do to do so, even if that meant sharing that more vulnerable side of yourselves. Oh, man. I think that's a, a great question, first of all. Um, for me, what started it was, first of all, it was, a, it was mental health uh, from being in a very toxic work environment, but it, it turned into physical health issues. So um, last year, uh, July 7th, 2021, yes, we're still in 2020. Oh my God. 2022. 2022. Oh my God. Okay, sorry. 2022, July 7th, 2022. Um, I was rushed to the ER because I had um, a freak thyroid malfunction. My neck swelled up. I couldn't eat for a week. I lost, I'm already a slim person. I lost 12 pounds in one week and I almost died. So being in the hospital and experiencing that, I, I realized like, what am I doing with my life? Like, I'm doing the things that people expect me to do. Go get a real job, go make money, go work nine to five, go make money doing some job that's gonna suck the soul out of you. So um, that's what I did and it put me in the hospital and almost killed me. So I had to make a major shift for my life. And so now I think now my perspective when I'm creating and I'm writing, like I'm doing this to save my own life. And so when I share it out into the world, I hope that it does the same thing for other people and inspires them to pursue their life and pursue the things that give them life and not the things that take it away. Because there's, if you let them happen, there's a lot out there that can keep you from living your full potential and living your passions and being happy and free. And so now I can say that I'm living the life I want to live. It's getting better. I'm not saying there are challenges, but I'm doing the things I love to do. And I'm meeting people who love me and care about me while I'm being the person that I know I'm supposed to be. And 
that is that part is funny. So. <laughs> briefly touched on this earlier when I spoke on the uh, objectification side of some of the work that I have done. And I think that kind of what Anais was saying is that a lot of people have expectations of you. And I'm kind of in like a weird position writing a business book about the sex work industry because not only am I too sexual for the business entrepreneurial authors, but I'm also I don't know, a little weird for an OnlyFans girl writing books about <laughs> business. Uh, so I think I can sometimes feel it on both sides, and it can be a little... If you allow people to just whisper in your ear, you're going to lose direction. And I think that that's kind of why I made that shift. I haven't actually been on OnlyFans for about a year now. And it was kind of that situation where just the way that people interacted with me and the way that people viewed me really didn't align with how I viewed myself. And I unfortunately allowed that to make me second guess myself and I think over time and especially with finishing up writing my book I have been able to grow my confidence and that's really what made it easier for me to put myself out there because I I heard this quote one time that said like Whenever you're exiled from society is when you realize who you really are. And it's because if people know that you don't care to follow the most beaten path, then they get a little confused. <laughs> and sometimes that's fun. So I think that it's important to just be authentic to yourself and not really let people push you around. Another thing that happens often in the premium content industry is, you know, people start at a very young age when they're very easily influenced. And I feel like that really opened my eyes as I got older. When I was younger, I thought that I made a very sound decision. I decided like, do I want to be a teacher? No. Do I want to be a um, like a social worker? No. I even asked my parent myself, uh, if my parents never spoke to me again, would I be okay with that? And I thought that I went, I checked off all my boxes. And then through the time that I was creating content and then through the time writing my book and making like my YouTube videos, it really helped me build my confidence and realize that I didn't need to please other people. I didn't need to seek out male validation. And I just want to create content for the people who are there to support me. Well, I think the thing that I was thinking about in regards to the question, uh, I'm going to butcher this this quote, and I feel bad because it's quoted in my book, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, Dr. Brene Brown, um, and she said something to the effect that um, what does shame mean to thrive? And it's secrets and silence and guilt. And through this writing process, not only have I found the community of being with other creatives, being with people who are free to express themselves and feel comfortable in their authentic skin and embracing that, which is something that I didn't do for a large chunk of my life, but it was also the power of being with other survivors. Um, my foundation is called One in Three Foundation because of the World Health Organization statistic that one in three women in their lifetime will experience physical or sexual violence. 
And please don't let that be a trigger to anyone in this room, but that likely means that many of us here are survivors, male or female, however you identify. And when I looked at that and I looked at the statistic and I was listening and, and trying to find stories that were authentic and trying to find stories about people who had gone through my experience and the coping mechanisms that formed because of it, I found a lot of self-help books and I found a lot of how-tos and workbooks. I just wanted someone's story so that I, did, I felt seen and that I felt heard. And so I wrote the book that I was looking for. And what I found in that, in that sense of community that we're talking about, was connecting to other survivors. And how I overcame my own shame was every message that I have gotten from a survivor that says, thank you for doing this. Thank you for writing this. Thank you for speaking up. Thank you for your courage and your bravery, which my husband gets to hear me say all the time, I just be talking. I'm not really trying to say anything deeply profound most of the time, but you never know what resonates with people. And I think that that's where that community comes from. But for me to overcome that shame, I had to constantly remind myself of the why. Why am I doing this? And it was to help other people and help other survivors, but also setting boundaries for myself. Um, I wrote a tremendous number of what we call companion pieces, which are published personal essays to go along with the release of the book. So I was writing uh, stories that were published by Insider or Newsweek about being a woman in sports, about being a wife with sexual addiction. And a lot of times on pub day, those stories would go live, they would go viral, and Maya was nowhere to be seen. Um, I gave myself time and grace to say, I know this is out there. I know people are commenting on it. I'm not going to read the comments. I'm not going to read the reviews. I'm going to share it on my page when I'm ready. And that was a healthy boundary for me as well. But also, again, it came back to, I didn't know who those stories were going to reach. So the people who emailed me, the people who did reach out, I thought that I was going to get a bunch of icky, creepy comments or horrible, you know, Hester Prince, Scarlet A type comments, Scarlet Letter type you know, comments, but I really got love and support from other survivors. And that's the beauty that I see in this creative world of, of trying to connect and inspire. And that's why when people say your story matters, your story matters. And I know that that sounds like a cliche, but it really does because if we don't talk about these things, especially in a day and age where they're banning books and they're censoring whose stories get told, they're also hindering who gets helped. And because of that, it's a great disservice to the next generation. It's a great disservice to our family members. It's a great disservice to people who are just trying to survive. And I think that for me, it was a tremendous strain on my mental health. I have a therapy appointment once a week. I am not ashamed to say that. She got a Christmas card for me. Uh, okay. And I make sure to take care of myself and to take a step back. It's not always pretty. There are a lot of breakdowns, but I recognize when they're coming on and I recognize when I have to take a break from social media or take a break from writing about hard things to take care of my head. Shout out therapy for real. Um, I haven't seen my therapist in a week because she's on Christmas break. That's kind of rude of her. But, um, but no, yeah, a thousand percent. Community building is essentially all about inspiring the people that we don't even expect that we're gonna going to inspire. I remember kind of sharing, I think last year, I released a blog. It was called Real Shit Blog. It's still out there if you want to look it up. Um, I, shared, I shared a lot about mental health, and that's, I put it out there because I wanted to be open, I wanted to be vulnerable and build that community and let people know that they are seen and that they're not the only ones going through it. And when I did that, I did have a lot of people that I wouldn't have even imagined were going through the same things I did reach out. And they're like, thank you so much for sharing, thank you for telling me about therapy, like I actually just got my own therapist, I was like, oh my god, I didn't realize this was actually going to help anybody, I thought I was just 
like you said, talking on stuff, laughing, yapping, whatever it may be. How do you guys think that community building has helped y'all and supported you guys as a whole? Uh, a few of you came to my official book launch party, and one of the things that I mentioned in the speech that I gave there was how uh, just important it was to see the people that showed up for me. I spoke about how I came from a religious household, uh, very conservative upbringing, and so the fact that I kind of switched gears and started releasing premium content was very much brought the bond. And so moving from the rural community that I lived in here to Texas, and then obviously uh, moving to Dallas even more so, helped me connect with people that saw the world in a different way, like more like what I saw it and I wasn't stifled by the expectations of my family and where I come from. So it was just really important to me to see that not everyone wanted to shame me for those decisions that I made. Because you can really believe that everyone thinks that. If you come from the same background as me, you might think that your whole world, everyone is going to see that as wrong and dirty and bad. But being able to build a community who really uplifted me and shows how proud of me they are. Uh, there are people, I still sometimes am not very vocal about my book just because of the tabloid nature of its content. But a lot of my friends, when they introduce me to people, they'll be like, this is Teresa, she wrote a book, it's so cool. And that just warms my heart. Friends of Wichita. Thank you I, it's funny, I, I love this question because just yesterday was a friend of mine's birthday and um, I wrote her a poem. <laughs> she is in this room, but I'm not going to say her name. <laughs> I wrote her a poem, but um, it reminded me of our conversation that we had and um, basically the poem and what I kind of wrote to her after I shared the poem was um, how much her presence in my life has helped me expand. But not just her, there are so many other people that I've met within the past year and a half being on this artist journey that have helped me, um, helped me heal, helped me become more my authentic self and not be afraid to be who I am and express who I am. And um, I think it's just, it's such a beautiful experience to be able to have people like that that consistently make you a better person that you can consistently learn from. Um, I learned how to be social, pun intended, I guess, uh, from a lot of them because um, one of my friends was just so good and like such an open and warm, loving energy. And I'm like, okay, that's how you make friends. Like, <laughs> so, I'm like, oh, that's, you know, she can go up and talk to anybody. So um, I learn from people and I learn from their experiences. And, um, and I think that's where community becomes really important is, is your community people that you can grow from, learn from, and share your hardships, your wins, and your failures with, and they still love you, and they're still going to be there. And um, just having people like that in my life has like, seriously changed my life. And I'm very, very grateful. So. I think for me, one of the biggest parts of being part of the creator and creative community is speaking to what you said earlier. I grew up with this sort of perfectionistic, idealistic version of myself that was very much what my parents had created for me. And 
the parameters of who I was going to be and how I was going to dress and how I was going to act, um, being a good girl and all of those things, books, not boys, every lesson that I was told growing up in, in this part of the South and in the Baptist and all of those things was so ingrained in me. I didn't know who I was and I'm still working to figure that out. Uh, but when I say that, the thing that I love about this community, the creator community, is that for a long time I felt like I haven't fit anywhere. I felt awkward. I still feel awkward. But I felt super awkward because I was trying to be this. You think about your local news anchors, just think about what they look like. You know, like I'm not making fun of it by any means, but it's the suit and it's the perfect non movable mannequin hair and, you know, all of those things. And one of the first things I did was embrace having natural hair and starting to wear clothes that I wanted to. And when I got involved with the creator community and the creative community to see people dress the way they wanted to dress and speak the way that they wanted to speak. And it was something so freeing and empowering for me to see that, that it made me feel like it was okay to embrace the part of myself that I had suppressed just to please other people. And I think that that's the beauty of the community is the empowerment that comes from it. You mentioned service earlier, people that will show up for you and check in on you. I'm here in part because uh, I spoke recently at an event here in Dallas and Greater Jules was there and we connected on social media. And it, it's just beautiful to see that grow and that flourish and those opportunities come because I've worked in corporate industries too. I've done the networking dance and the entrepreneur handshake and all of that. And this is different. This feels like home, whereas that feels like trying to be someone that I'm really not. And I think that that's the beauty of this in the community is just being authentic. And it's okay to have wins and losses and with people who understand and don't judge me for that. Um, what we spoke a lot about, like breaking out of what we were accustomed to or what we were expected to do, and really going after what we truly wanted to do. What would be y'all's his top advice to people who know they need to do this and they really want to break out of that shell, that expectation? What would be y'all's advice to them to? really break out of that and really make the jump for it, even though they might be scared or some other factor may be holding them back. The first thing I want to say is that if you don't actively choose to do it, it will choose for you. And not always in the way you think it will be happening, and it won't always be pleasant, and it won't always feel good. Um, and that's what happened to me. <laughs> I can say that from experience. Um, but I would say it takes an extreme amount of courage to do what you love and you just go for it. And it's very hard. Um, and my story, I would not have been able to do that if I didn't, if my husband didn't support me. And I recognize that I do have privilege in that area. He can take care of me. And because of that, I'm able to do the things that I love. If I didn't have someone like that, it would be a completely different. I wouldn't be here. So it's acknowledging people that help support you, and maybe it's not in that way, but um, it's very difficult if you don't have a solid foundation underneath your feet. So my advice would be do the little things you can do along the way and watch it grow and build something and be patient because I'm not a very patient person. I want everything like right now. <laughs> so um, this journey has definitely taught me to be patient with myself and be patient with my growth. Um, but yes, I would say make active choices every day towards what you want that are 
um, that you can be consistent with, that are attainable, that don't require you to spend thousands of dollars or even hundreds of dollars or even tens of dollars. Um, do the things that are free first um, and keep doing those and keep being consistent and then more than that. Yeah, definitely hitting the goal with the patient's thing. That's what I'm learning right now. I would say my advice, just on my own personal journey, is that you kind of have to check in with yourself. Uh, just be reflective. Um, kind of what we've been talking about this whole time is getting to know yourself and what makes you feel good in like a productive way, not just like an instant gratification kind of way. And one thing that I'm very fortunate for having my experience as an only trans creator, uh, kind of similar to what Anna used to saying about her husband, but you know, I was working my own hours, I was creating content, I was working from home freelance, obviously. And so I had a lot of time to sit around and think. And I think that a lot of people don't have that opportunity because of just like this rat race of, like they were saying, the corporate world. And I just think that sometimes it can be easy to get caught up in. And in that period of self-reflection, I realized that I needed to be more disciplined. And I think it can be easy to just say, oh, the best way to grow on social media is to be consistent. But I think you really have to build your self-respect and how you see yourself before you're able to make that kind of commitment to yourself. You know, it's so easy when we see our friends, our family, the people that we love. And I think a lot of people wouldn't let down their loved ones the same way that we're willing to let ourselves down and not follow through with the promises that we make to ourselves. And that's one thing that I'm very proud about completing my book. I have always had issues with following through. I have been diagnosed with ADHD. Like I just, I love starting projects and I am terrible at finishing them. And I've even said on many occasions, you know, I didn't really care how many copies of my book that I sold just because with every milestone that I completed as I was writing this book, I could feel that, you know, self-respect and love for myself growing. And I think that that is ultimately what helped me make that decision to leave the premium content world because like I was saying earlier, you know, I really let people tell me who I was supposed to be or what they expected of me. And I let people make me believe that I had no other options because, you know, they say, maybe you're not smart if you do this or like they'll question your morals or your judgment. But I just think that I lost my train of thought. I think if you're going to step into the world, the, the world of your true creativity and do something that feels bold or courageous or daring to you, my advice is don't share your plans and your ideas with just everybody. And I say that from a place of someone that overthinks, someone that is a people pleaser, and someone who has been influenced most of their life by the opinions of other people. And so when you make the decision to do something and to step into authenticity to do it, not everybody that's going to say that they support you truly needs that. It's the same that not everybody that's cheering for you is actually rooting for you to win. And 
for me, there's a, if you're familiar with uh, Who's Books here in, uh, in the Oak Cliff area with John and Claudia, uh, I was talking with John, the, the co-owner, and we were talking about memoir, and he was saying, um, we were talking about an author who, who said, if he, if his mother had still been alive, he wouldn't have been able to write the book that he wrote. If he felt his mother had to die for him to be able to write it. And so many times in trying to be authentic and share personal stories, we get discouraged or whether it's music, whether it's our art, whether it's something that we're writing, whether it's poetry, whatever, whatever we're diving into, when it's personal, we often worry about either the impact it's going to have on those around us that love us or their opinion. And so I would say make sure that you have, I keep talking about Renee Brown, I tell you, I'm not like, a, I'm not like getting paid for anything, but, um, <laughs> but she, she talks about marble jar friends. And your marble jar friends are those people who, when everything's hitting the fan, are going to tell you like it is, but they're going to love you and they're going to support you through. And I have a lot of colleagues and a lot of associates, and I have, on, I can count on one hand how many people I count as Marvel Jar friends. I know that I wouldn't have been able to write the book that I wrote if I had told my family up front what I was doing. I did eventually have to tell them. Uh, they didn't read it until it came out. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of legal stuff, you have to get people to sign things, all of that, but I would not have been able to do it if I didn't have those people, my husband, some of my closest friends, some of the counselors that work with the foundation, cheering me on to put my heart and soul on the page because I would have been so worried about what everybody else would say. And it was an exercise in, in me silencing shame. And I think the same thing should be done if you're going to Whatever it is that you create, video, you can do videos and music. If that's what you want to do and you want to pursue it as your passion, don't let other people's stuff influence what you do. So be careful who you share those initial ideas and plans with, and then step forward into what you believe is the right steps. Get guidance from people who have walked your walk and use that community of good people to help buoy you along the journey. Thank you guys. It was very much insightful, especially to me, I was taking notes in my head. Um, but one big round of applause for them, one more time. <laughs> Instagram is good as golden. Uh, website is good as golden.com. X, Twitter, whatever we're calling it this week is uh, Maya underscore golden. And um, I'm happy if you want to send a message about your personal experience uh, or share or if you're looking for help or support, I'm always open to talking and, and guiding people where they can get help if I'm not the person that needs to get them there myself. I love your story. I'm very inspired by you. So I'm glad you're here. Um, my website is anaismusic.com. So just my first name, A and A I S S S M music.com. I do have to spell it because I'm the one that's going to spell it. <laughs> um, you can also find me um, by my artist name on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, anu.anais. Um, yeah, I'd love to connect, collaborate if you're a visual artist. I'd probably really need to collaborate with you on some things. Uh, that's not my strong suit, so let me know, show me some of your work, and we can make something beautiful together. I would say the easiest way to connect with me is on Instagram at TeresaAP98. And if you go 
go to my Instagram page, go to my YouTube channel for more tips and tricks about running your own fan site or other fan site subscriptions. And also the link to my book are both in my bio. All right, everyone, give it up one more time for these wonderful people. has an amazing voice and a beautiful sound. She is our expert, our only performance, a headline performer. Um, at ease, stage is all yours. I really need to take a quick break. Yeah. <laughs> I will be right back. Yeah, wait,
This next song is about bad bosses. Some of you have heard it. So if you got a boss that you'd like to convert, this one's for them. <laughs> <laughs>
just want to get a good view. Pretty cool. <laughs>
of water after Next song, um, by the way, my whole set is 100% original music that I have written or collaborated with other artists with. So um, you guys being here, listening and supporting means a lot to me. And I'm really, really happy that every single one of you are here. You belong in this space. And I'm so glad to share it with you. Thank you. 
Love you all. Happy New Year. Let's do some fucking awesome shit in 2024. Thank you. Thank you so much. We found another one. So the night is not over. We have. Yeah. 
If you will, if you have a glass, will you raise it with me really quickly? And if you don't have a glass, just raise your hand. <laughs> Uh, I want y'all to repeat after me. Say, I, I am, am a, creator. a creator. I determine, I determine my, reality. my reality. And my reality, my reality. is good. good. Happy New Year's, everyone. And cheers. DJ JB5, you ready for it? We can wait for you.